On this Thursday night, a long-awaited landmark agreement for none of it. We're finally completing Confederation. The territory takes control of its land, water, and resources. New revelations about the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Law enforcement violated its most sacred responsibility. How lives could have been saved if not for the cascading list of failures by police. Pushing back against armed settlers in the Holy City. Never, never I'm going to leave the house. The uncertain future for Armenians in Jerusalem. And put your money where someone else's mouth was. Sir Winston Churchill's dentures are being auctioned off. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. A big political development in Canada's northernmost territory. An historic agreement has been signed by Nunavut and the federal government, transferring responsibilities for public lands and resources from Ottawa to the Nunavut government. It is the largest land transfer deal in Canadian history, involving 20% of Canada's land mass. Nunavut's premier says he is proud of this milestone. This is the next big step and the next chapter in the story of our beautiful territory. We didn't. The moment was celebrated in Iqaluit today with a ceremony that included traditional music and dancing. It is being called a new beginning for the Inuit and First Nations people in Nunavut to control their land and their future. In our top story, David Aiken explains how important this is. A solemn and ancient ceremony. We came from a land of snow, a land of ice. A land with its own traditions. And now, a new future for Nunavut. We didn't, and we're ready. Our land, our resources, in the hands of our people. Until this moment, it was politicians in Ottawa who had the final say on the development of Nunavut land? No more. The government in Iqaluit will now be responsible for the territory's freshwater, wildlife, lands and resources. And Nunavut, not Canada, will collect all the resource royalty revenue. We could now bring decision-making home right here. Open now. Today begins a new chapter in the history of Nunavut, a transformative chapter. We're finally completing confederation. We're a a accepting Nunavut into the into the country um, as an equal partner, not provincial status. There's no desire to have provincial status in the Northern Territories, um, but it's pretty close to that. The territory of Nunavut was created in 1999, but devolution negotiations did not begin until 2008. They moved slowly until those in Nunavut were confident they had the capacity to take on the new powers. Most federal government employees who work in the territory will become territorial government employees. And Ottawa will provide the territory with a one-time funding package of $15 million to assist with the transition. Devolution became reality in Yukon in 2003, in the Northwest Territories in 2014, and Nunavut now joins them. So darn exciting. For people in the North, this is actually about, about throwing off the shackles of Ottawa gaining sort of control and autonomy, and taking responsibility. A three-year implementation period now gets underway, with devolution set to officially conclude on April 1st, 2027. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Quebec's premier says an influx of asylum seekers to that province has nearly pushed it to the breaking point. Premier Francois Legault has sent a letter to Prime Minister Trudeau saying services have been overwhelmed and asking the federal government to slow the number of people entering Quebec. Mike Armstrong is following this story tonight from Montreal. Mike. Well, Donna, one of the things the premier highlights in his letter is the airport behind me. Francois Legault says Montreal and Toronto's airports have become sieves for asylum seekers entering the country and that something has to be done. The letter from Premier Legault to Prime Minister Trudeau paints a fairly dark picture of the situation right now in the province. He says resources are stretched to the limit and calls it unsustainable. Legault outlines several challenges Quebec is facing and says each is being made worse by the influx of asylum seekers. There was already a housing crisis, now there are more people. Homeless shelters were already struggling. Legault says they're now overflowing. The education system had a shortage of teachers and space. Schools are now strained even further. And the various organizations that help asylum seekers can't keep up with demand. 
Now, the letter also flags some numbers. In 2023, from January to November, Quebec took in more than 59,000 asylum seekers. That's close to half of what the entire country took in. In 2022, Quebec did actually take in more than half. There was hope that the closure of Roxham Road south of Montreal last winter would cut the number of asylum seekers. It, in fact, seems to have only moved it. Airports are now the main gateway and the numbers haven't gone down. As for remedies, Quebec's Premier is calling on Ottawa to slow the number of asylum seekers entering Canada by tightening visa controls. He wants asylum seekers spread out across Canada more evenly and he wants Quebec reimbursed for what it's spent receiving asylum seekers. Ottawa's response today came by press release from the federal intergovernmental affairs minister. Dominic Leblanc says the federal government is taking the situation seriously and that he's looking for ways to ensure the integrity of Canada's immigration system. One of the things he says they are considering is moving asylum seekers to other parts of the country if they're willing to go. Donna? All right, Mike Armstrong at Montreal Trudeau International Airport. Thanks. Today is the deadline to repay SIBA loans given out by the federal government to small businesses during the pandemic. For those who haven't paid back the financial relief of up to $60,000, outstanding loans will convert to three-year loans with a 5% interest rate starting tomorrow. Business owners who met the deadline can keep up to $20,000. Anyone who applied to refinance before today can get partial debt forgiveness if they pay by March 28th. A mix of snow and ice is still creating some dangerous conditions in many areas of BC's south coast. A driver in Abbotsford, east of Vancouver, was struck by a snowplow and killed early this morning. Police believe the driver's vehicle had spun out and that he was walking along the side of the highway when he was hit. More snow and freezing rain is expected in southern BC and parts of Vancouver Island later today. In the U.S., three people have been killed in Portland, Oregon, after a power line fell on a parked car during an ice storm. The latest series of winter storms is being blamed for at least 40 deaths across nine states since January 12th. Today, over 66 million Americans are still under winter weather alerts, as another round of storms is expected to bring dangerously cold temperatures and snowy conditions to both coasts. A new investigation into one of the worst school shootings in American history has found significant failures in the police response. The massacre happened in 2022 in Uvalde, Texas. 21 people died, many of them elementary school children, as police failed to confront a gunman for nearly 77 minutes. The report by the U.S. Justice Department breaks down how inaction cost lives. Jackson Prosco reports. He's in the class. The haunting images from the Uvalde massacre only tell part of the story. Next one, next one. The U.S. Justice Department's deep investigation into what happened reveals a cascading series of failures by the people who were supposed to run toward danger. The victims and survivors should never have been trapped with that shooter for more than an hour as they waited for their rescue. Please hurry, there's a lot of dead bodies. It was already known police waited 77 minutes to confront the gunman in a classroom. The Justice Department called that the most significant failure, saying officers should have pushed forward immediately and continuously until the threat was eliminated. Lives would have been saved and people would have survived. The egregious errors went further. Some parents were told their children had survived when they had not. One adult victim was left to die on the sidewalk. These victims who had already passed away were taken to the hospital in ambulances. Well, children with bullet wounds were put on school buses without any medical attention. Ahead of the federal probe, several officers and the local police chiefs were fired or resigned. To date, no one has faced criminal charges. They didn't need the report to tell them that law enforcement violated its most sacred responsibility. For the families, police inaction and a lack of transparency are still impossible to comprehend. We have nothing left but to fight for them. We are their voices now, so we're going to continue. Hoping to prevent the next school shooting, the Justice Department's report contains an astonishing 273 recommendations. None will bring back the lives taken in Uvalde. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. 
For the fifth time in a week, the U.S. has attacked Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen, and the American president says it will keep happening. President Biden says the U.S. and British bombardment still hasn't stopped Houthi rebels targeting commercial ships in the Red Sea. The rebels want Israel to end its siege of Gaza, and today their leader promised to continue attacking commercial vessels despite the retaliation. Pakistan has launched airstrikes inside Iran, claiming it targeted Pakistani militants who were being harbored there. At least nine people were killed. Pakistan claims it is protecting its national security. And two days ago, Iran fired missiles into Pakistan, claiming it too was targeting militants. Tensions are running high in an unstable region. Crystal Gamansing reports on efforts to restore order. Cell phone video from Iran shows some of the damage in Sistan and Baluchistan province. State media reports nine people, including four children, were killed in strikes along the border with Pakistan. None were Iranian. This morning's action was taken in light of credible intelligence of impending large-scale terrorist activities against Pakistan. National security was the justification, but earlier in the week, Pakistan warned there would be consequences for Iran striking inside its territory. On Tuesday, Iran hit targets which it said were related to an ethnic Baluch Sunni Muslim militant group. Military activity in the Middle East has spiked. There were the Iranian Pakistani strikes. Iran hit targets in Iraq and Syria, citing national security. Israel's war on Hamas in Gaza. Hezbollah in Lebanon striking targets in Israel in support of Palestinians and Houthi militant bases in Yemen targeted by the U.S. and the U.K. and backed by other countries like Canada with the goal of protecting vessels in the Red Sea. Israel's president quickly noted the actions of Iran and those it funds, Hamas, Hezbollah and the Houthis. Spending billions of dollars in arms and money and people's well-being to derail the entire stability of the world and the region. China, Jordan and Turkey are all calling for Iran and Pakistan to show restraint. We as Turkey recommend that the problem should not escalate further. Tensions in the Middle East will be back before the UN Security Council in an open debate next week. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Israel's prime minister has said he told the U.S. he opposes the establishment of a Palestinian state once the conflict in Gaza comes to an end. Israel's allies, including the U.S. and Canada, are urging Israel to revive the notion of a two-state solution. The U.S. says there is no way to solve Israel's long-term challenges to providing lasting security and establishing governance in Gaza and providing security for Gaza without the establishment of a Palestinian state. Benjamin Netanyahu, though, has always opposed that. Today, he said Israel must have security control over all land west of the River Jordan, which would include the territory of any future Palestinian state. A class action lawsuit over a popular herbicide. Coming up, the safety concerns over Roundup. A 22-year-old Nova Scotia man has been charged for allegedly starting what turned out to be the largest wildfire in that province's history. The Barrington Lake wildfire started last May in southwestern Nova Scotia. More than 23,000 hectares were scorched. At least 6,000 people were forced from their homes and 60 houses destroyed. Dalton Stewart has been charged with lighting a fire without permission on privately owned land and leaving it unattended. If convicted, he could face a fine of up to $50,000 or up to six months in prison. An Ontario court has certified a new class action lawsuit that alleges a popular weed control chemical causes cancer. The lawsuit asks for at least $1.2 billion from Bayer, the maker of Roundup products. The company denies the claims despite a long list of similar complaints against it. Abigail Beeman reports was given a 20% chance to live two years. Diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at age 17, Jeffrey DeBlock didn't think he'd live to be 46 years old. He attributes his cancer to a summer farm job beginning at 14. He sprayed crops with the herbicide Roundup. Its key ingredient, glyphosate. 
the product in, in its current form is just simply not safe and, and it's carcinogenic and I really don't want to see other people going through what I've had to go through. Glyphosate, the most widely used herbicide in Canada. In 2015, the World Health Organization's cancer research arm found it probably carcinogenic to humans. About 165,000 claims have been filed in the U.S. against Roundup's parent company Bayer alleging illness, with at least five plaintiffs winning cases last year. In Canada, a 2019 review found glyphosate unlikely to pose a human cancer risk, with use approved until 2032. Health Canada tells Global News its pest management regulatory agency monitors new research. Canadians are being used in a massive experiment. But a former co-chair of the agency's scientific advisory committee resigned, calling for a complete overhaul of pesticide regulation in Canada. Bruce Lanfear alleges Health Canada limited scientists' ability to ask questions and wouldn't let them examine a study looking at glyphosate levels present in Canadians' urine. The agency tells Global News no information related to safety was withheld from the committee. I worried that my presence on this committee would give people the impression that I did think we were protecting Canadians. This month, Bayer removed glyphosate from all household products sold in the U.S., not agricultural. When Global News asked if they would do the same in Canada, the answer came back no. The company says the decision wasn't made because of any safety concerns, but solely to deal with the mountain of lawsuits it faces in that country. Well, I want to see my kids be able to go out and walk in that field. Farmer Christopher Dermott is concerned about glyphosate's effects on soil biology and his family's health. We are in the transition of phasing out glyphosate is my hope and dream. We have a nozzle body. He says the natural herbicide he's using is effective if more expensive. Roundup is so popular because it's cheap and it works. Bayer tells Global News it will vigorously defend Roundup's safety, confident its products did not cause Jeffrey DeBlock's cancer. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Feeling forced out ahead, the fight to preserve the Armenian community in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the holy city, home of prophets and patriarchs and the prize of empires. There is no other place like it on earth. The three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, were born in Jerusalem. There are temples and shrines to all of them within a short walk of each other. And thousands of years later, as Danielle Hamamjan reports, the struggle between them is still going on. On an ancient street, that leads Jews to the Western Wall. <laughs> That's used by Catholics during funeral processions. Lies a piece of land that's home to the oldest Armenian community outside Armenia. And its residents, only a thousand now left, are fiercely protective of it. You believe that uh, you have to take care of something. And this is it, okay? The old city of Jerusalem, it is a maze, divided into four quarters, the Jewish, Muslim, Christian and Armenian quarter, which is the smallest, making up less than 20% of the area between these ancient walls. It's also the only one not dedicated to a religion. Now, after 1,600 years in the Holy Land, the future for Armenians looks bleak, not because of immigration or a low birth rate, but rather because of a real estate deal struck by the community's own religious leaders. He's not a real estate this is sacred but also prime property that was leased to an Israeli real estate developer for nearly 50 years with an option to extend it to 100. This, uh, this building is part of the deal. Uh, this is our events hall. So to this point, uh, from the ramparts to this point, it's 11,500 square meters. Hagop Janazian is leading a protest against the deal that would see a luxury hotel replace a quarter of their section in the old city, including five family homes. One belonging to Garo Nalbandian. If this goes ahead, what is your plan? Where will you go? I'm going to die here. 
never, never are going to leave the house. In late October, the developer sent bulldozers to begin demolition. Then came the armed Israelis and the dogs to harass them, the residents say. <laughs> Among those present, an Arab Christian business partner who Armenians, also Christians, called a traitor. The priest who was the architect of the deal has since been defrocked and kicked out. But it's the patriarch, the head of the church here, who signed off on it. Thursday, on Armenian Christmas, he sent a bishop in his place. Your community feels betrayed by you. The Armenian patriarch has since tried to cancel the deal. The case is now before an Israeli court. Donna. All right, Danielle Hamamjan in Jerusalem, thanks. Odd auction item next. How much would you pay for the teeth that saved the world? The Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, is expected to spend up to two weeks in hospital after abdominal surgery. And today, her husband, Prince William, went to visit her. He's taking time away from royal duties while she recovers. Kensington Palace says she's doing well and that her condition is non-cancerous, but have not said what it was that requires such a long hospital stay and then several months of recovery. There's something going up for auction in the UK that could take a big bite out of your wallet. Winston Churchill's dentures. Known as the teeth that saved the world, the former British Prime Minister wore them while giving many of his most famous speeches, including the We Shall Fight Them on the Beaches address in 1940. The dentures were so important that Churchill is said to have carried around two at the same time. The guide price for the February auction is £8,000. That is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is these deer in Carmen, Manitoba. A parcel or a bevy of deer? Not a herd because there's only a couple of them apparently. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again on Monday. Bye-bye.